All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Adventures in .NET. We've got a special show for you today. I'm Sean Clabo and with me on the panel are Caleb Wells. Hey, everybody. And Charles McWood. Hey, everybody. And our very special guest today, all the way from Microsoft, is Mads Christensen. How's it going? Go Good. Through, Matt. We're very happy to have you as our first guest. I have to claim some privilege. I've actually interviewed <laughs> Mads before. I'm going to put a link in the show notes for JavaScript Jabber. We met at right. Microsoft Ignite a few years ago. So we did. Right. Yeah, Mads is our first guest. You know, I think of you as uh, Marilyn Monroe was to Playboy, but with clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> Mads is better looking anyway, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I can just picture the dress and the blown up skirt now. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, let's get started into the topic today. And what we're going to talk about is uh, building extensions for Visual Studio. So Mads, what would be the f- first thing that somebody would have to uh, do if they wanted to start building extensions? So I would say have a good, good idea. And, you know, it sounds trivial. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like um, have an idea of how this thing that you want to build, how it should actually work. So before diving into any technical implementations or anything like that, like kind of crystallize in your mind, should this be a button? What happens when you click the button? Like be, be, a, be a product manager for, for a minute up front. And the reason why I think that's important is that will kind of highlight maybe what extensibility points and mechanisms that you need to code against, right? What APIs to use. And so coming up with the user experience first, like knowing this is the right user experience, this is, this is what would make me the happiest when using, if I could do it this way. You know, that, so that's writing, very... Writing an yeah. extension that nobody wants to use is kind of pointless, right? Yeah, so, so think of the details. Flush it out. I'm not saying do a storyboard and, and you don't have to do that sort of stuff, right? But, but imagine yourself using it and thinking it's the greatest feature that you've ever used. Like, what would that then look like? So, okay, so now you've done that and you know what you want to want to build, then you want to go to Google and search for getting started writing Visual Studio extensions. <laughs> <laughs> and that will, that will get you into a blog post on the Visual Studio blog that kind of outlines the different things uh, to keep in mind when you start out and give you a good kind of starting point. It will show you a video of how it's done to kind of take away some of the, um, remove some of the scary aspects. You know, if, you, if you've tried a little bit in the past and thought, oh, this is a, very hard to do and it's like I don't know where to what to do here and and the interfaces look weird and it's all unnatural to me. Like there's a one hour video that kind of takes you through and kind of removes sort of the the mysteries and the and the weirdness um that you might think exist. And, you know, and it does exist. But it kind of familiarizes you with it. So that blog post is a really good place to get started and then make sure to watch that video. Uh, do you have a link to that video we can put in the show notes? Yeah. Okay. I kind of want to ask, because you're, you're talking about the idea here, you know, have a good idea. I mean, how far, how crazy can you get? Can, can you, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe you build the documentation engine that will play a video in, in Visual Studio. Or, you know, mm-hmm. when I hit an error, it, it plays a Sean Wallace going, inconceivable! Or, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, how crazy can you get? Because I think the standard ones that we think of are like code highlighting and you know, picking up on certain patterns and saying, maybe you want to do it this way or doing linting or things like that. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, how, how nuts can I go? You know, what are the capabilities here? There is no end to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. So think of Visual Studio as just a WPF app that can host whatever code and run under the permissions that the current user got, right? So you can write custom WPF and inject it into various places. There are at least these standard places such as the editor surface or custom tool window or other places like that. And, you know, add new IntelliSense stuff. Uh, We're familiar with those type of things, but you could potentially, if you, if you really wanted to, I'm not saying that's a good idea, but you could put WPF anywhere because it's all WPF, right? It's all a hierarchy of controls. And so you can inject anything into anywhere. And so you, you really have no limits, and so whatever the user ha- has permission to do on the machine, like, you know, you want to do a web request to a web server to get like your video content, daily new videos and show that when the build fails or whatever your idea was there, uh, you can totally do that. There's no, no limits. There are some things that we consider maybe being best practices and staying within those <laughs> might be a really good idea, not just for, for you, but for your, um, if you want to have like a successful extension. I have to push the limits. That's my job. <laughs> a successful extension is feels natural to the user. And it feels like it's not in the way. 
and it feels mm-hmm. like it belongs in VS. It behaves like a feature that was built by the Visual Studio team. Right. right? And so if you start doing crazy things, people are like, hey, this is not, this is not natural. This doesn't feel right. Gotcha. So it's, a, it's probably in your best interest to keep with the design patterns and to the, so the UX patterns and standards that Visual Studio is already using. So your limits are really just your imagination and your common sense. Really. <laughs> yes. I wanted to ask you, Mads, you've been doing this for a while now. You've, you've been at Microsoft for almost nine years. Uh-huh. Uh, you have over 120 extensions on the Visual Studio Marketplace. Wow, that many. Yeah. And what got you into creating extensions? I think it was the sort of the, 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 the burning question, what if, or it, it would be cool if, right? That's sort of the, it's sort of a nagging feeling that when you're using a, uh, an application like Visual Studio, like eight to 10 hours a day, like that, it's your second home, right? You want to customize them. You want to put your, you know, your drapes and your colors on the walls and, you know, make it yours. And you kind of find all these things that are not working optimally for your scenarios or things where there's, there's no solution to a specific thing you want to achieve. And, and so, so you start getting all these sort of ideas and, and, and the question, it would be cool if I could do this. It would be cool if, if that bug wasn't, was fixed. It would be cool if this scenario made it easier for me to be a web developer by doing something web related, right? Um, all these sort of things are, uh, it just kept nagging at me. And then one day I decided to try it out. And um, yeah, I haven't looked back since. And so that was pretty early on. That was 2011, I think. So I think within my first year here at Microsoft. So another thing that happened was that we were rewriting. So I was when I started, I was the program manager for the web tooling in Visual Studio. And so the HTML editor, CSS editor, and all that stuff, some of the ASP.NET specific things. We, we were going to introduce a brand new CSS editor. And that actually came out in Visual Studio 2012. And when we thought about we should make this extendable, well, one thing is to have an API that we feel is good. Another one is to have an API that we've tried and we know is good, that can actually do all the things that a real extender would want to do. And so I started as, as a kind of a tester, actually, on the API to see if I could write an extension that would do all these different things, that would extend all the different aspects of the CSS editor, just to see if there was any things, you know, and, and so... I worked with the the developers and we came up with like tweaks and made things easier and added new extensibility points to open up for these possibilities that I would want. So I would actually build features that I wanted myself as a web developer. Right. Right. So this thing grew and grew because I had to hit every single API that the CSS editor had and also hit it in multiple different ways to enable all different scenarios, just to make sure we had good coverage of all the different possibilities. And that, that's how Web Essentials, the, the extension from back then, started. And so it came from features that I wanted myself. I never implemented anything that I didn't want to use. And so that kept me motivated, right? And it, right. Was, it was that nagging feeling. Like I got to, um, to scratch my itch. As a, as a program manager, I can't code. I'm not, you know, I don't code in Visual Studio, but I can write extensions in my spare time or in my work hours or whatever, right? So, so that helped. That got me going much faster. So I imagine some things are easier to do than others. So when somebody's first starting out, what what are the things that they should think about that might be, you know, a first step to create? Well, you need a good foundation. So like with any other app, whether it's a Windows Store app or a Google Chrome extension or whatever it is of, of a thing that lives in an ecosystem, there are certain similarities between the successful ones. Well, so what makes a what makes a good high quality extension? And so if we look at sort of the, the baseline of that, we're talking about like, make sure you have a good name and description. Make sure that the description of the, on, your, on the marketplace where people acquire it, your extension in this case, they can read and see animated GIFs and animations and screenshots and have a full and deep understanding of what the extension does, what it looks like, right? Make sure you have uh, high quality icons, license. Is there a privacy notice that you need to add? Then do that. There's a bunch of baseline things. You know, all the high quality extensions out there all share these traits. And so it's, it's super important. You're simply not going to get any downloads. We know this. You're not going to get any downloads if you don't have a beautiful looking icon. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can steal it from somewhere. It doesn't matter what it looks like. But, it's, but you know, have the right file size and quality. 
and the name is descriptive. So instead of giving an extension like your last name, let's say, right? Well, what does that mean to the user? Like that doesn't know the extension, it doesn't mean anything. So you want to be descriptive in your in the name of the extension, which is kind of interesting. And then the de- description itself, which is a one paragraph thing, very small little thing, you have to set expectations. So what is the problem and how does this extension solve it? Very briefly, you have one paragraph, it's very short. And then you have the huge description, which is the one you can add images and all this sort of stuff too. And so you want to set expectations, you want to meet them so that the user doesn't say, hey, why doesn't it do that? I thought it was going to do this, but it didn't. So you don't want to end up in that situation because then you're going to get a low rating and then you're going to get fewer downloads. So there's a bunch of all these steps that we go through. There's nine. And it's funny that we're talking about this because tomorrow morning <laughs> I'm releasing a blog post on the Visual Studio blog about these nine things. So awesome. Cool. Yeah. So those are the base, but this is before we even code anything, right? right? So now when we go into coding, well, it very much depends on what you're going to do. Are you going to add a context menu button? Or are you going to create IntelliSense for a new language that doesn't exist, um, that we don't have support for? Those are two very, very different concepts. And so it's hard to tell you that, oh, if you're new, you just have to do one of these things. Watch that video. Mm-hmm. That will give you sort of the baseline. The way I, I kind of look at it is this is a new API. If you're just starting out, this is a new API. You don't know anything about it. But if I can empower you enough that you know what to search for, then you got what you need to proceed, right? right. So if you if you look at that blog post, yeah, we'll link to it, of getting started, then you can kind of, and watch the video, then you will learn what the terminologies are. You will learn enough that you can go to Google and to GitHub for instance, that's another thing you'll learn. You'll learn that you'll need to search on GitHub. A Google search or a Bing search is not enough sometimes. We have to search on GitHub to get the code samples we need. And so if you don't know that, you don't know that, right? And so that's why that getting started document is, is pretty important. Do you think that uh, it's easier these days to write an extension than it was back in the early 2000s when you factor in how Microsoft is embraced open source and with things like VS Code. How do you feel about, you know, where extensions are um, in the Microsoft space? Um, it's interesting you ask because we had just after build, so in, in the beginning of May 2019, we had a the very first extensibility day that we hosted here uh, in Building 18 on campus in Redmond for anyone that are interested in extensibility and writing extensions. So we had a bunch of people, including like people that worked for Microsoft, but also like just from all over the world. And I asked them this very question. Like, is it, do you find that it's easier today than it was? Because it's hard for me to to answer it because as I get better at writing extensions as it, and as I do it more and more, like, is it, is it me that's getting better or is it getting easier? That's a hard one to answer for me. Right. So I asked the audience and they like completely agreed that it's easier. And they say specifically because of the open source aspect of things these days. There are samples for everything. There are uh, prior art. So that's why the GitHub search is so important because of the open source aspect. So all my apparently 120 extensions, they're all open source. If you don't know how to implement certain things, find an extension that does something similar. And chances are that it's going to be open source and go look how they do it. And so because of that, that very thing is what makes all the difference. But then on top of that, there's been a lot of improvements, iterative pr- improvements over the last couple of years in sort of the project templates, the way we distribute the NuGet packages. So for instance, it used to be that the Visual Studio SDK, you needed a NuGet package for each API. And so I think there's like close to 100. So, okay, so what version of each are you going to use? And it was like a constant issue. And what if you want to support both Visual Studio 2017 and 19? What version do you then use? And do you then... And maybe you, let's say you reference 25 of these new packages. There's likely going to be a version conflict because you got something wrong and we didn't help you to get it right. There's been some changes since uh, Visual 2019 handles extensions versus Visual Studio 2017, right? How it handles new packages. Yes. Extensions. Synchronous loading versus asynchronous. Isn't that a change? That is, yeah, that's a change. But what I'm talking about is not the version mismatch of the Visual Studio itself, but of the API new packages that oh, you're okay. going to code against. Okay. Let me get back to that other one because that's an interesting thing as well. So now we have one single NuGet package 
that gets you all those 100 packages in the right versions that you need. So if you want to write against Visual Studio 2017, you get the, the 2017 API package. So this is a concept we borrowed from ASP.NET Core. And right. it makes all the difference. It's, it's, it's anyway. So those are. It, that's an example of how we like incrementally improve things just to make things simpler. But the the real reason is the open source aspect. That's what why. About, it's what about systems like uh, Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio Code? Uh-huh. Th- those are a little bit different than Visual Studio 2017 or 2019, aren't they? So yeah. So Visual Studio Code is completely different, right? It's, it's um. There's uh, nothing shared between Visual Studio right. and Visual Studio Code. One is written in uh, .NET WPF, and one is written in TypeScript. And so the extensibility model is not only different in the way it's hosted, like one is hosted on in, on Chromium and one is hosted on .NET and native. You can do either. But also the API paradigms are very different. So in Visual Studio Code, you have a single extension host paradigm that says, here are the different things that you can extend. In Visual Studio, that we don't have that. In Visual Studio each of the different features in Visual Studio determine their own extensibility story. And you request one or more services from an API they expose to get access to their things. Right. So there's not a single sort, there's not a single place that says this is what the surface of the API looks like. There are so many different isolated and individual things. Now granted they probably share a lot of the types between them, right? Mm-hmm. But they are they are kind of their own. And so it's just fundamentally very different in nature. And so we can't, like, whatever you write for VS, you can't use in VS Code on the other way around, with the exception of text-made grammars. Those work in both. What about Visual Studio for Mac? Is the Mac version different from the Windows version? Yes. Again, that was a, a product that started many years ago on top of, you know, using Mono and all that stuff. What we have been doing in the last couple of, since the acquisition of Xamarin has been to port the Visual Studio API, starting with the editor APIs, into VS for Mac. And we're actually at a point now, in the latest release of VS Mac, where the base APIs for IntelliSense classification, tooltips, and all the light bulbs, all this sort of stuff, is the same. And it's the Visual Studio for Windows APIs that have been ported over. So I think there is an example out there. We don't really, I don't think we have an official example yet because it's so new, but it allows you to have a shared project where you store all that code, and then you have a project, a Visual Studio extension project, and a Visual Studio for Mac extension project that both reference that shared code. And so, but it gives you two outputs, right? So each of those projects will create a Visual Studio extension and a VS for Mac extension. And um, that's really cool, but it's limited right now to editor APIs. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, so it's a, it's a step in the right direction for sure, right? Yeah. I forgot to mention as well that there is support for the language server protocol between VS Code and VS, and the debug adapter protocol. So those are present in both of those things. You still have to register them using each editor's native APIs, but the underlying language server itself is probably just an XE or it's written in the language that in which they support, right? So you just need the runtime to be able to execute it. And so that's an out-of-process kind of thing. Uh, that's shared, right? So that's that works on both. Nice. Yeah. So I'd like to get back to Sean's question because uh, I'm actually not familiar with uh, this change 2019 for extensions, asynchronous versus synchronous. Uh, we, we don't have to go deep, too deep in the weeds, but I'm just curious about what that actually provides to mm-hmm. someone using Visual 2019. Right. So it's a change that came about because of um, performance and reliability and um, had bigger consequences within Microsoft than outside, I think. Okay. But the idea is you can write an extension and an extension can automatically load itself on certain events. One of those events is solution load. So whenever the first solution is being loaded, your extension wakes up, right? It's initialized. Another one is when Visual Studio starts up. And there are other ones, like when a Mm -hmm. certain file with a file extension, C-sharp file extension is open, then initialize my extension and so on. There, There are multiple of these and you can define your own sort of events to listen to, to, to wake you up, basically. Now, the problem is that when you do that in, in the solution load example or in the startup, Visual Studio startup example, when we synchronously then load your extension, it does an assembly load uh, into the app domain, right? And it runs through an initialization, and then it calls your code the initialize method that you provide, 
and then you go about and doing whatever you need to do to initialize yourself, right? And um, that's all on the UI thread. So uh, that's, a, that's a UI blocking operation. And so that means that Visual Studio is unresponsive while that occurs. Now, for very small, simple extensions, that is not the biggest problem. But what we really like to do is to do that all that initialization on a background thread so that it doesn't interfere with the UI thread. It will never cause Visual Studio to be unresponsive or hanging. So in the past, is that why you would get like that yellow bar at the top saying this extension is causing a slowdown or extra load on Visual Studio? Do you want to disable it? Yeah, so there were several several cases yeah. uh, where this was one of the ones that could cause the yellow bar to show up. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. And so the change in 2019 is that we, by default, say if you're not asynchronous and have enabled what's called background load. So basically, if you can't be initialized in the background, you're not going to be initialized at all. Wow. Right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's off by the, it's, it's the default behavior. You can revert that decision and say, okay, no, I actually want to load anyway. But by default, we're not going to do that. And um, that uh, has had a, a tremendous impact on startup performance and solution load. A lot of times, these things were like invisible to the end user. The end user had no idea how long, how big a percentage of a solution load was caused by a, a, an extension that they couldn't imagine in their wildest imagination, you know, would do anything to slow that process down. But it just happened a lot. And I so, can see why that would be a big change from Microsoft's standpoint, right? Because everything with 2019 then had to be made to be asynchronous. It also meant, yeah. So when, I think it was 15.8, so 2017, update 8. Okay. Also known as version 15.8. At that point, all the Microsoft extensions, if you will, packages that had autoload, and I forget how many it was, but it's a lot, that are built into Visual Studio, they all had to be converted to this new thing. That was that was what we said. 15.8, all the Microsoft built-in ones have to be async at that point. That was a huge endeavor <laughs> because every team had something, at least one thing, right, that right. They, they needed to change. So that was just, that took a long time. But we had like a publicly to the to the extenders out there. I think we gave them 18 months advance notice. And so one thing is that you have to say, hey, I'm I'm async capable and I'm you can you can load me in the background. That's one thing. That's a declarative thing you can say. But really what it means under the hood is that your starting point is async. It's a task. Right? And that changes the dynamics completely. And so sometimes it was very easy for you to, to incorporate that change, but sometimes it wasn't. And you had to learn, well, how do you do this special scenario that I'm doing in this async world all of a sudden? And so for some people, it took longer. And, um, you know. Yeah, this change uh, broke one of my favorite extensions. And unfortunately, I've stayed with Visual Studio 2017 just because of this extension, hoping that they update it. And I don't know how familiar you are with the uh, custom and custom document well. Oh, yeah. So that's one of ours. That has come up. Uh, we're still, we're actually working on it. Great. Yeah. So, and that's not open source. It is not open source because, so, <laughs> okay, you want a story of productivity pro tools? Here it goes. Matt's uh, so, going to tell us why it's not his fault. That's, <laughs> that's what we're going to hear. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's true. No, productivity pro tools was a closed source thing that came out in 2010, I believe, or whatever, a long time ago. And some of the features were rolled in, but most of them stayed in productivity pro tools as an extension up till this day. A couple of years ago, half of them were made open source. The other half, the team decided that they're actually doing things with Visual Studio that are not considered best practice that we don't want to teach people how to do. <laughs> you know, this is the thing about injecting like WPF in, into the tree in ways that are not like something we want to teach anyone. Anyway, so the, the custom document well was one of those extensions that remained a closed source because it changes the way that the tabs work. Right, yep. so it actually That's injects. Why I love it. <laughs> hey, what? That's why I love it. Vertical tabs. Yeah, and so the problem was that to inject SAML into VS in those places that we don't have support for, let's say, or undocumented, is that now that we have async package, your extension is loaded after Visual Studio paints itself, after the WPF is rendered on screen, the initial, the, what we call the shell, and so it's too late to inject that SAML now. And so that's why we couldn't port. That was one of the only extensions that we couldn't actually make work in this new world. And so now we're looking at, okay, we can't really do it unless 
but we have this switch where we can say, okay, you can do it anyway. The community has figured out how to do it. So Sean, if you go and you search Stack Overflow for how to uh, yeah, I'm on that, I'm for on this, that can... thread and I just didn't want to do the hacky way yet, but okay. and end up doing that. Okay. Yeah, it's, you can do it. No, so right, right now we're we're actually building in some of the features of that custom Dockwell extension. Vertical taps is the is the uh, one that causes the most issues for us. So, so that'll go into the core product, you think? That's the hope. We don't know what that's going to look like. Is it going to be a full implementation or is it going to be is it going to be iterative? Like, is it going to start as like a, a sort of a doc outline tool window on that side that, that just looks like it has tabs on it? Or is it going to be like the full implementation? We don't know because it also takes time for us to, to implement these things. So, so we take them. There's like 12 features of that extension. And so okay. we're prioritizing the individual ones and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah. no, I think the, the idea is that it's going to come in the, go in the product. But exactly what it's going to look like, I don't think we have an answer right now. So one of my favorite additions to 2019 is the search tool, how it's, you know, there's so much more you can do with it now. And right, I've gotten used to in VS Code using the search tooling in there for like my Angular projects to get, get around and create stuff and find things I need quickly. I really like how that's been updated in 2019. What's yeah. your favorite change in 2019? Well, that's definitely one of them. I don't know if I have one. I have several. I really like the new blue theme. It's just such a relaxing thing to look at. I'm not a dark theme. Well, actually, I use the dark theme for most any other apps but Visual Studio. Okay. okay. But yeah, so that's another one. Um, I like that there are now certain commands available, for instance, for to do a git pull. And so I can now assign a keyboard shortcut to do a git pull on the solution, which before I had to go to Team Explorer, you know, and right click or something like that, uh, or the or the command line, right? And now I can just do a keyboard shortcut to do the same. That's so cool. that's another big one. Yeah, what else? I don't know. The performance, like, it's just so much faster. Right. I like the new Toast notifications in the bottom, the way that the notification system works now. I right. think that's a very clean, nice looking way of doing that. Yeah. Cool. Are there any um, extensions that you're currently working on for 2019 or VS Code? Have you written any for VS Code? No, I have not. I've, it's been on the back burner for a long time, and I just I, it keeps getting deprioritized when I get a good idea for an extension for Visual Studio. <laughs> <laughs> so I just never get to it, I guess. That makes sense. I'm not working on an extension right now. I'm working on exploring what what could we do to create a new... API for extensions. Uh-huh. Like how, how can we unify, how can we make sense of, I talked about all these different services that are provided by each of the different aspects of Visual Studio. Right. How can we make that discoverable and easy to consume and sort of in a .NET friendly way, kind of hiding away sort of the underlying calm infrastructure of things. So I'm looking at that. That's on GitHub. I'm kind of just playing with it. So you can you can follow along there if you want to suggest ideas but the idea is to to maybe maybe it's an api wrapper right to make it easier to write extensions one less barrier to entry yeah exactly but to be very clear so it might be a nougat package that you can use right that might be the result of it and therefore it will work forever for whatever version of visual studio it will target so so it would be safe it's something that's safe to use probably but it is a i'm playing around with things right so use it your own you can copy the code into your project and all that sort of stuff if you don't want to wait for a NuGet package, which may or may not come. But think of it more as sort of an academic exercise. But to be fair, a lot of my, like half of my extensions have started their way like this and become a real product, right? So yeah, just that's the state it's in right now. I've, I've noticed, at least from what I've watched and read, that like over the last couple of years, right, Microsoft is becoming less and less siloed. Right. And so teams are feeding off each other or learning from each other. How's that affected your team, like with .NET Core, right? And two and upcoming three in the next version of C Sharp. How's that, how's that impacted your, your workflow? Oh, man. And I think in a lot of subtle ways. So one of the biggest requests from the extension community is .NET Core support. Like, how can we write extensions using .NET Core or .NET Standard, really? And so that's something we're looking at, right? So, but that 
requires a lot of collaboration because that mean need, that means we have to be able to execute it. I don't think you can execute .NET Core within .NET and a .NET app domain or whatever. So how does that then work? And so that's something we're looking into. Uh, we have a bunch of AI stuff like IntelliCode, for instance. Right. Uh, feeds off of AI, which is an Azure thing, and you know, and I think that's probably a back and forth. Like, how does machine learning and AI and all this sort of stuff affect and come into a different Microsoft product instead of just being like externally focused? And so that's an interesting thing as well. And it, you know, it's really cool that we can start leveraging. Well, we've always been able to, but but there's like a it's a very natural place right now where we can kind of feed off of things that other teams within Microsoft has created in different organizations, right? Yeah, so it feels really good. So one of the APIs we're looking at um, for extensibility right now looks like it might borrow from some concepts that ASP.NET Core is using when they bootstrap services. And so it's very inspirational. And since people also move around here, they bring like uh, knowledge that they have from different teams with them when they come to this team and when they leave, they bring, you know, so there's like a natural flow of information that just is really, really nice. Yeah, so the door is open to anything. Awesome. But I, I will say, though, I mean, I was on the .NET team until I started the Visual Studio team, and the Visual Studio team, like, less than two years. So even though I worked on Visual Studio as well, it was technically on the ASP.NET team and the .NET team. And they've had uh, they've had this sort of culture all along with open source and all this stuff. So I haven't really felt the change. I've heard it, the change in other people that have a different history than I have. Right. And so, um, yeah. Cool. So are there any extensions that you think aren't as popular as they should be? Not yours or others that you know about? You're thinking, this is a really cool extension, but the, it's just not getting as nice download you think it should be. No, I don't think so. People are really good at finding quality extensions. If there is an extension that is uh, that has general appeal, let's say, that is not getting a lot of downloads, then it's probably because it's description or it's name or it's, it doesn't have a, a, a you know good screenshots that shows what it does. So the marketing aspect is missing or it's implemented in the wrong way. Right? It doesn't, it's not the UX is just not up to par. It doesn't feel right. And so I think like the extensions that do get downloads, they're, they're doing everything. They're doing those nine rules, right? And um, yeah, so no, when I kind of look at, there are things that I'm kind of wondering about, like that I used some of my extensions that I've, that I come to rely on. And I'm surprised that not everyone in the world uses them. Right. Until you realize, until you look at other people's coding in Visual Studio, you realize they just have different workflows. There's like, it's really hard to have a concept that applies to 100%. Like there's actually very few features in Visual Studio that has 100% of users using it. So I have a simple little one that resets the zoom level in the editor when you hit control zero, zero. Uh I only have a a laptop. And so half the time I don't have a mouse. And so... Resetting the Zoom level has been like an issue for me and annoying to me for years. So I just created a shortcut for it. Can you set the Zoom level that resets? Yeah, you can set If you want your default Zoom level to be 110%, then... That's what I use, yeah. Yeah, then you set it to 110. Okay, perfect. Because, yeah, I always seem to slide on my mouse and it have the control key down at the same, ki- same time and it zooms in on me. So, yeah. so I'll get that one. Yeah, it's called Reset Zoom. Okay, <laughs> very cool. Good descriptive name, right? Right, exactly. Does what it says it does. <laughs> so that's so that's one there's like okay, it doesn't have a lot of downloads, but then you know, then I look at someone that has a mouse and they oh, they just control scroll, uh, you know, zoom in and out. Oh, that's kind of handy. You know, I understand now why they don't need this extension. Or I they just, just don't zoom a lot. Think, yeah. So one thing I I wanted to to talk to you about and and, and maybe this um this right. This is separate from the extension talk, but with Visual Studio 2019 and .NET Core 3 coming out, C Sharp 8, is there anything in, in in those that that you're using a lot of that you that you found they're really good features that other people will will um, really benefit from? Oh man, that's going to be such a disappointing answer. <laughs> I have not looked at .NET Core 3 yet. I'm, I'm sure it's amazing, but I I just haven't had the time to look at it. Gotcha. I guess I'm I'm in a position where um, with my company we're we're rebuilding our application from scratch, and we 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 started with .NET Core when it was release candidate and Angular release candidate working on a 
the project we're wrapping up now. And so I'm dealing in these the, the new stuff to see, hey, you know, what, what are we going to be able to to get out of it going forward? But, yeah, l- lucky you. Yeah, we're not all right. that lucky, even within Microsoft, though. Even though we're pretty good at it, there's, um, uh, as I said, like, I think if, if, um, if Visual Studio, if you could today write an extension in .NET Core, yeah, then I would have played around with .NET Core 3. But what I do, it's actually not possible. Right, gotcha. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I, I do plan uh, to update a couple of websites to uh, ASP.NET Core 3. So they're right now running on older versions. I have one I have one that's currently running on the first, no, the second beta of what's it called, DNX. Yeah, DNX, I remember that. But it's beta 2 or beta 5, I don't remember. So this is before it was even called .NET Core. Right. It used Project JSON instead of MS Build file, yeah. And so, you know, I have nothing that can edit it. So that website is completely without, I can't maintain that website. It works until it doesn't, and then I have to rewrite it. You're, you're bringing back memories of, right, before release candidate when they were still hashing things out. Yeah. Yeah, right. I remember the project.json was a, was a big deal, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people loved it and some people hated it. But, yeah. I liked it because, so at the time, I was the, the PM for the, for the web experience in Visual Studio, for the ASP.NET web experience. And at the time, we didn't have a JSON editor in Visual Studio. If you opened a JSON file, you would just get plain text. And because of Project JSON, that became, that became the leverage I needed for us to spend time building a JSON editor. Awesome. And so if we look, there's a lot of things that you know, is used today in ASP.NET Core concepts and all that that was defined by, by back then. Right. But um, the, the, the legacy that I remember the most and use the most is probably the JSON editor. Which, by the way, completely revolutionized the entire JSON ecosystem or created a JSON ecosystem, which I'm very proud of, but also kind of fascinated by a little bit. And so what I mean by that is, um, is the JSON schema for configuration mm-hmm. files specifically, or usually. Yeah. And so there was something called JSON schema out there. And we decided that instead of us writing specific IntelliSense for project JSON, we should do it in a generic way so that... Uh, and J- that's what JSON schema can do. It can provide sort of schema information to specific JSON files, and therefore you can derive validation and IntelliSense based on that schema. Very similar to XSD schemas for XML files, but that's maybe where the similarities end. <laughs> it's not the best. It's not the best definition in the world, but it's easy to write. And I think we did such a good job, such a good job, that it became kind of standard. When VS Code came out, they did JSON schema implementation. We started seeing other IDs like the IntelliJ and um, other IDs like that supporting right. JSON schema. And they all started supporting this website that I run called schemastore.org. It was a place where I put up JSON schema files. And then we built support into Visual Studio where it would actually automatically pull schemas or discover schemas defined on schemastore.org. And so the API on schemastore.org will basically say it will have a file globbing pattern. So let's say it has one called project JSON and associate that with one of its schema files. So Visual Studio will, when you open a project JSON file, it will ask, hey, schema store, do you have something that can handle project JSON files? And it says, yes, here's the project, here's the schema for that. And that was a very successful pattern from like the beginning a pattern that was in replicated in different IDs. And so I get several pull requests per day. I think there's over a hundred schemas now for all sorts of things, Angular, Travis CI, um, you name it. And it's branched into YAML now as well. So you can, there are several editors that have YAML editor that will provide intelligence and validation based on James JSON schema. So you will have YAML schemas defined in JSON up there as well on schema store.org. And so that has been immensely successful. And I think it all started with Visual Studio's support for JSON and for JSON schema. I don't think I've ever told a story anywhere that I think that's where it all came from. Because that, when we started, there was nothing, nothing. There was like one or two NPM libraries that would provide validation. So mm-hmm. you could say, here's a, here's a JSON file and here's a JSON schema file. Validate the JSON file against the schema file and give me the errors, if any. So it's very elementary. It's now, it's, it's commonplace. It's everywhere. Yeah. 
TypeScript, Angular, even the Red App Settings JSON files and, and Visual Studio projects. You don't yep. have the project JSON anymore, but you still have the, the, the schema there. And, and of course, with our projects, we're using the app settings to determine environment and what points to what and, and all that. So, yep. yeah, very cool. So that all started there. And I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I never heard anything from anyone <laughs> about any of this, but, you know, it's still going to this day. And, um, yeah, it's one of the things I'm I, I'm most proud of, I think. That is like a sil- it's been a silent hit without anyone yeah. really noticing. Yeah. Well, thank you for for getting that in place, right? Project JSON actually produced something that we're still using to this day. There you go. That's great. Yep. Well, Mads, we we know you've got a you've got to head out in a few minutes. So uh, normally at the end of uh, our podcast, we we pick something doesn't have to be you know .NET or or even programming related that we're interested in right now. I want to see if you could give us a pick on home automation because I saw on your Twitter that says you're you're a home automation enthusiast. Yeah, that's right. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> you so you got it covered, huh? Well, yeah. Well, for myself, right? I haven't done implementation right. for other people's homes. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a rabbit hole that you can go so deep into and spend so much money on. And, and I have, <laughs> you know, I just fell in both feet uh, after playing around a little bit and um, I love it. It's like, it's my fix. I can't, I can't get enough of that stuff. It's, it's so interesting to me. Have you been to Bill's house? No, <laughs> no, he's never invited me. <laughs> so, yeah, so what's implementation there? What's your favorite, the favorite thing you've implemented in your house automation wise? Because I can imagine the, a ton of the stuff. latest, the latest. It's always the latest, I think. Um, okay. But I always go back and and sort of uh, modify and and adjust things. A couple of things that I find super useful, but are not sort of very visual or very sort of they don't sound so cool. But something as simple as turning, you know, when I open the windows, that it in my house that my thermostat stop heating the house. Oh. Very very boring thing really <laughs> actually but it's just really nice to know that i'm not you know spending money i don't have to also stuff like when i forget clothes in the washer right after an hour after the washer is done if i haven't opened the washer i'll get a notification and my wife gets a text message saying hey there's wet clothes in the washer and i think after another half hour or something i think alexa she announces in the house that <laughs> there's wet clothes in the washer I um, love it. So you know, telling your wife that you haven't unloaded the washing machine. No, <laughs> no, I don't dare to do that. <laughs> well, sending hey, a text but, message. Yeah, but but hey, Alexa can do it, right? I mean, that's you can get away with that. <laughs> yeah, I guess. No, it's always whatever is the latest, right? It's um, what I found is that it's very very similar to my job here at Microsoft uh, working on Visual Studio, in that you have to upfront figure out what you want to do, have an idea. Then you're going to figure out, well, what is the user experience going to be like? What are the rules that's going to apply to this automation? Is it based on a motion sensor? So when motion sensor detects presence, turn on the lights. Okay, well, how is it going to turn it off again? What, what, when motion no longer is, you know, there's all these things to think about. What if the door is closed after the motion is, has been detected? Then what? Like there could be all these sequence of things. So once you figure out what should what the right automation rule is, then you figure out, okay, that means I need, you know, two sensors, you know, one motion sensor, one this and that, and maybe I need a, a, a switch on the wall that's that can be automated and, and whatnot. And so it's very similar to sort of a, a, a UX design job, if you will, like, like mine is here at Visual Studio, because you, I have to design for other people. I have to design for family, for little kids. I got two little boys. You know, and then extended family coming to visit, uh, other guests coming that don't come there often enough to remember anything. And so what you strive for is something that can be used by 100% of your of people in the house at any given time. And you never want to do special things. You don't want to put the house in a, oh, it's in a guest mode because I have guesting or so different rules apply. To me, that's a failure. That's like putting settings in Visual Studio so that the user has a way out of the feature that you created, for instance. That means that you didn't design the feature correct. If they can get out of it because they don't like it, back to the drawing board. Rule of thumb, you know, it's not always. uh, (laughs) 
but that that's how I look at things. And so a lot of similarities. And so I just love it. It's a creative outlet of the same sort of, it would be cool if it's just that you get. Cool. Are yeah. you using a hub for that or like, yeah, like I'm a commercial smart, hub? I'm using smart things. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay for what it does. <laughs> <laughs> so smart things your pick or not your pick? Uh, it's what I picked. Would I do it again? No, I would not do it again. <laughs> what would you do instead? You have these vendor lock-ins, so it's actually hard to move. It requires like a week. Or you'd have to take a week's vacation to move to a different ecosystem. It's totally possible, but it's just annoying. I would probably today, I would, I would um, pick Habitat maybe today. Because Hopitad is very similar to, to SmartThings. SmartThings is, is created by Samsung. Or, no, no, it was bought by Samsung and it's run by Samsung. Hopitad is its own little startup, Kickstarter startup thing. But you get the same thing. You, you get a box and I think you get automatic updates and there are some things like that too. So it's managed hardware to an extent, which is what Samsung gives you as well, which is what I want. I don't want to mess with hardware. I don't want to get a Raspberry Pi and install software on it, and no way. That severely limits my possibility. So I think I would, uh, I would, I would grab a Hopitat today. And I say that because they have made updates recently that makes that a valid choice, I think. All right. Nice. So one thing I want to mention uh, before I get to my picks is that if any of the listeners out there want to join discussion groups for any of the devchat.tv podcasts, go to devchat.tv, and at the top there's a link for chat and you can just join a discord group with any of the shows that uh, are on devchat.tv. So Sean, what's your pick? So I have a couple picks today. One of them is a product I found recently called dot VBM. It's a uh, kind of a mix between, I would say web forms and MVC. And it really was nice for me because I have a lot of stuff in my projects that are still web forms that I do want to be able to upgrade and make ready for .NET Core. And .VVM supports both full framework and core, but it has a lot of components that are the same as you use within web forms. So you can really kind of do kind of the same structure type of thing in your code with a little bit redesigned in the back end that you can. So it really helps that migration to keep up with the time. So .vvm is my first one. And my other pick is going to be saltlatecity.net conf. It's coming up on uh, September 19th. So if anybody is looking for, it's just a one-day short conference, but if anybody's in the Salt Lake City area, they can go to slcnet.tech and look at the information there for saltlakecity.net conf. Okay. Great. Well, my pick is it's actually something that uh, Microsoft released fairly recently, and that's Xbox Live for PC. So, right, uh, if you're watching it at E3, you probably saw it, but uh, you pay a monthly subscription and you get access to um, a catalog of games. That in itself is nice, but the feature that I like the most is it actually integrates with Xbox Live. So, for instance, I can play uh, Sea of Thieves with my brother who is playing it on Xbox. So that's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. All right, Chuck, do you have some picks? Yeah, let me jump in with a couple. So uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, I kind of jumped in and helped host this one. And I've been playing with Azure Functions. So, of course, I'm doing JavaScript, not uh, .NET, but cool stuff there. And uh, I've pretty much got things together the way that I want them. What I'm building is, and I could go on a long rant that I won't, but the current state of stats for podcasts is not not what I would like it to be. Let's we'll put it that way. And there are some movers and shakers in the space, and this is where the rant would come in, that I don't think are acting 100% in good faith as they track your stats for your podcasts. I've had some really funky things happen with the reports that I get from them. And so I was like, I'll just build my own. And then right. um, I went to Microsoft Ignite, I think it was, or Microsoft Build. Uh, I went to both. Anyway, um, wound up talking to a bunch of people, and uh, I think it was Build this year. But I talked to a bunch of people about Azure Functions and I realized that I could probably pull together 95% of what I wanted with like three functions on Azure. <laughs> you know, and basically it's, you know, you hit the endpoint and it 
tracks the download and then refers you out to wherever it is that the file is stored or you know you could just store uh-huh. it block storage on azure and then you know set up a couple of azure functions on insertions into cosmos db that would essentially you know build the reports and so i was like this seems really simple to me and i'm only paying for it as i use it so right. yeah anyway that's been a really really uh fun thing and then my wife and i started watching season 3 of stranger things and we've been enjoying that so Definitely going to get in and watch the rest of it. It's nice because you can just sit down and binge watch it. Unfortunately, we've been super busy the last few weeks. So we'll probably just take some time, you know, when I get back from the conferences I'm going to this week. I haven't been able to get my wife into that show. So I'm trying. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> I, I've, I've, been, I've really been enjoying it. So, yeah. Well, Matt, uh, thank you for joining us today. Been a really good, good talk. Do you have anything else you wanted to pick? I mean, we grilled him about home and home automation. Yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of uh, told him what his pick was, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that works for me. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more.